Yes, thank you, and welcome to this talk. Yeah, uh, long title there, and uh, so thread three consists basically of me from the humanities lab, and has been also Jonas Björk from epidemiology and Matthias Olsson from computational biology. So you can say that this thread has been sort of a mixture between epidemiology, language technology, and machine learning, because what we are trying to do in this thread is to predict, to discover things from uh, the written word, as, <laughs> as it says there, and particularly looking at uh, abstracts of scientific articles and try to extract things from them. But I will come back to that. Uh, why do you want to do that? Well, of course, because we produce a lot of text these days. Uh, a very well-known medicine database uh, is PubMed, which some of you might know. There are currently, well, I think it's, there may be even more <laughs> as today, 20 million, 28 million citations of biomedical literature, different studies, papers, mainly abstracts of there, but lots of them also have links to full-length papers. And about 40,000 is added per, mon per month. Uh, and actually that number is probably even more <laughs> now. I, I, I don't even remember when I, when I got that figure. Uh, but the number of uh, text that, uh, articles and stuff that we produce grows within a very large You can also look at our things like archive, which may contain more astronomy and uh, physics papers. There are easily more than a million papers, if full-length papers is that then. And at least 10,000 are added per month, and that's a figure I found from 2016, so that's likely more uh, as of today. So you can imagine if anyone tries to <laughs> track all this, it's impossible to do for any human person if you want to have uh, some kind of view of a field or something, even in a subfield, it's really difficult to uh, follow everything that happens in your field. So we struggle to process all of this. So the idea here is then to try to summarize these things and discover facts and events that are crucial for your, uh, your special field. And to do this we need some kind of uh, automatic way of doing it which we can refer to as text mining. I just like to take a few, uh, like to set the scene here for language technology. This is a uh, slide from Dan Jurafsky. Here are different, this is not everything you can do in language technology, but this is it's just a quick overview of some things that language technology is uh, doing and sort of where some of the things, I mean, these things may be a more more sold than others here, still some progress being done. And here it's more, I mean, here it comes more to understanding the texts that are being produced, and these are still really hard. And the things we are working with, you may, you may put somewhere here, information extraction and summarization is perhaps what this thread has been mostly about. So, where does medicine come into this? Well, we have as our, uh, well, sort of thing to study, sort of, is uh, a thing called cohort studies, which are used in epidemiology. And these kind of uh, papers that are written, I will tell you <laughs> a bit about a cohort uh, later, but basically it's, you have a, a cohort is basically a collection of people you have them here, and then you record stuff about them, like their socioeconomic status, their lifestyle, biomarkers, which may be uh, blood levels and uh, uh, your height and weight and stuff like that, and also genetic markers. And then you tend to follow them. You follow them for a couple of years, and then you s see what happens to them, basically. So if they die, or if they get some kind of disease, cancer, obesity, diabetes are very common ones, or any 
health conditions. And basically you try to then connect these. So two different, two uh, important concepts here, exposures and outcomes, which are very occurrent in these uh, kind of studies. Uh, and the papers written about that uses these kind of studies tend to follow a pattern, and that is what we are trying to leverage, as it were. So the goal here is sort of to document the usage of these cohorts, because that's a kind of uh, imp uh, demanding task. So basically, we have a cohort here. We have chosen a cohort here, which has been... Uh, which was started, it was built in the 90s. Uh, they had 25,000 healthy volunteers available. Uh, and yeah, we, these things were recorded, uh, yeah, lifestyles, health examinations, things like that. And the thing is that the papers written that use these cohorts in, in those papers, we can find all these different things, like the aim of the study and the exposure and the outcome of the study, and also different things that will appear in the paper. So we decided we have designed sort of a case study that was used, used this specific cohort. Um, more about the case study. So uh, this cohort is called the Malmö Diet and Cancer cohort. Uh, the thing here is that the scientific value of a cohort increases with time because the longer you can follow people, the more things happen to them, as it were. So, I mean, people get older and get more susceptible to diseases. So we actually get more and more uh, outcome value from it. But the thing is to document all of this in ex extensive population uh, cohorts. Uh, because research has been carried out for several decades on these cohorts. So it's kind of demanding to find all the papers and to track all the things that happen. So that's why we try to extract this information from these abstracts. And just some numbers here. Um, if we query, because this is basically our method that we, we look in this PubMed database, and you can see that if we just look for the word cohort, we find 400,000 papers, something like that. If we combine, so cohort and diet, 8,000, cohort and cancer, 60,000, uh, diet or cancers, uh, and cohort, 68,000. Uh, what we used is uh, actually this one, <laughs> the smallest one. So we searched for Malmö, diet, and cancer in order to find papers that use this specific cohort. You can also see here, this is, this is actually diet and cancer. So you can see that this, uh, it grows sort of. This is 2010, there were 94 items. Uh, this is actually this number, I think now. So it's a bit, uh, so there are 2000 papers. So we kind of limited ourselves to this Malmö diet and cancer cohort just to make some kind of sanity from it, uh, of it. Uh, <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, this is a typical abstract from one of these papers uh, in here. So what exactly do we want to know from this? Well, you can I try to do something like this. So you can try to uh, find things like uh, the rhetorical structure or something like that in these Paper. So basically dividing it into the introduction, the method, the results, and the discussion, because they normally tend to follow this order. There actually is a model for this called the IMRAD model, uh, which I M R D, uh, which is commonly used to applied to uh, this kind of research. So this is, but this is basically what we want to get out to to sort of not not color it in this way, but to sort of structure, get out the structure from these abstracts. And that's a rhetorical, but we also want to have more specific information, like the exposure and the outcome of the study, so that's colored in red here, smoking, education, physical activity levels, typical exposures. And the outcomes are things like stroke, uh, cardiovascular, no, uh, yeah, cardiovascular disease, uh, 
I don't remember what CAD is right now, but it doesn't matter. It's a sort of coronal disease. So you see these things is what we want to extract from the texts. Uh, abstract can look in very different ways. Uh, this is our data, so to say. So sometimes they are very structured and this is, I mean, in these kind of, uh, it's kind of small, but in this kind of, we almost don't have to do anything because sometimes abstracts are really, really, I mean, we have all the information here almost already. Uh, this is not very common, but sometimes you actually get abstracts that look like this. More common is that you perhaps have something like this, that you have a partly structured abstract. So you actually have these things, background, method, result, conclusion. So this is quite nice because here we can get, I mean, here's rhetorical structure here is kind of given. But we still may want to go into the specifics here to get the conceptual thing. I mean, to actually get the exposure and the outcome and things like that. Uh, I actually don't have any numbers of this, but I think the, no, the most common kind of abstract is this kind, <laughs> where you don't really have any structure like this. You have just free text. I mean, this is mostly what people do. So here we have to go into it and try to find what, what are the, where is the introduction? Where is the method described? Where are the results? So our, uh, the way we attack this is to do it by a sentence-based approach. We split these into sentences, the abstracts. We have defined our rhetorical categories. This is kind of a bucket category, introduction, aim, background. They are usually expressed in more or less the same way. So we, and also the discussion conclusion is sort of... Uh, in the same vein. And then we have these different facts that we want to specifically get out. And exposures and outcomes are usually the most important one. But there are other things that we may want to know from this. And so here the machine learning comes in because what we do with this is that we build a sort of sentence classifiers that tell us if for a given sentence it can tell us does this sentence mention or is in some way related to uh, the different categories that we have. And for this we use, of course, some kind of natural language processing and machine learning. In order to be able to do something about this, we need sort of to analyze the abstracts. We need to uh, annotate them in principle because the machine really doesn't know Anything. So we actually have to go through the abstracts and eat for each sentence we ask ourselves the question, does this uh, tell us something about the exposure, does it tell us something about uh, the statistical method or something like that. So we go through some of these. We actually only have done this for the 92 of these. We have found 354 abstracts uh, using this Malmö diet cancer cohort. This is what we have done so far. So 92 abstracts have been processed, 1,000 sentences. So each sentence was annotated by two researchers. Uh, there were disagreements, but we solved them. Uh, the trick here is to turn this into sort of kind of a binary decision task. So does the sentence explicitly mention or is it in any way related to aim, exposure, outcome, etc.? And then we mark it as well, positive, otherwise negative. So 14 categories and 40 decisions per sentence. And this is very similar to a sort of popular NLP task called sentiment analysis, where there are numerous methods. And a very common one is uh, NBSVM, which is combination of naive base support vector machine. Actually, this is some numbers on our inter-annotator agreement, because when you do when different people do annotations, we get this kind. The interesting thing here, I mean, you can, this, this gives you somehow scores of how difficult it is to get, uh, for two annotators to get the same. Uh, so we see that the green ones are the ones where we have, uh, where we analyzed the sentences similarly, but the red ones are the ones where it's kind of tricky. So it kind of tells you something about how difficult each category is. An important number here, we might 
also be this, this that we call sync, because this is how many we have in the, in the positive category. And you can see that some categories are very unbalanced. We had a thousand sentences, and for instance, this assessment of endpoints, we only had 16 <laughs> positives. So that kind of shows uh, that's also kind of difficult to train uh, a machine learning system on. Uh, I mean, for some categories, it's quite nice. I mean, these these are pretty good. I think that we have uh, a good, but it, it it says something about how many positive examples we have per sentence. Um, what we do is that we use something called the vector space model. The basic idea here is that sentences consist of words and that words describe the content. Uh, the vector space model says that each unique word in a collection of sentences, or it could be texts or documents or whatever, basically becomes one dimension in your classifier. Uh, and then if you look at each sentence, each sentence becomes a vector where you have a non-zero weight for each word in that sentence, and you have a zero weight for the other words. So the words become features in this data mining sense. And since we have both positive and negative, uh, negatively classed sentences, uh, the thinking here is that if you have words that occur more in positive, positively marked sentences, they get positive weights. And the other, the other way around. If they occur more in the negatively marked sentences, they get negative weights. And actually a nice way of illustrating that is to do a plot like this. I'm using a package here called scatter text. And this, uh, it actually, yeah, it actually shows up quite nice here. But you can see this is for, let's see. <laughs> uh, which category is it? Uh, it's for method. Uh, so you can see uh, here we have the the negative frequency, the the words that are negative in negative sentences, and here we have the words that are in the positive sentences. So you can probably see up here you have lots of words that are associated with. Uh, sentences that describe the method. But down here, you have the other way. I mean, here, here you have the words that occur more in negative than in positive. Here, up, up here, you have words that occur a lot in both. So these are not very good for our <laughs> classification. Uh, and here you have words that are generally not very, I mean, they are just uncommon, but they can still sometimes help. But the important ones are these corners here. So these ones are good indicators of negative, uh, that, not, that the sentence is not uh, a method sentences. But these ones are sentences that are good for positive sentences. Uh, this is actually an interactive plot where you can go through it, but I don't really have time to go into that now. Uh, so what we do is that we do we do machine learning on this, so we use this vector space model, the words. So the annotation tells us if a sentence is positive or negative, and then we use the log ratio between the positive counts and the negative counts, and then we use support vector machine to uh, try that. Uh, we, the way we do this, we don't have that many, I mean, it's kind of a small corpus, so then we can use this leave one, out, leave one abstract out cross-validation. So we basically train on 91 of them, and then we classify on the, thanks, uh, on the last one, and then we sum that up. So it's leave one abstract out, and we do that because there's, there's probably some kind of correlation within an abstract, so we leave that out. And the score that we care most about here is something called the F1 score because that's somehow better when we have unbalanced categories. And it's basically where you use the true, the true positives uh, times twice and then you add the false, divide that again with itself and the false positives and the false 
negatives. We also have sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy, but they are, yeah, especially the accuracy. So here are our results. And looking at the FC score, you can see that we get, I mean, <laughs> one is good, zero is bad, right? <laughs> so the green ones here basically are the ones where our classifier performs quite well. So we have, for almost all the rhetorical categories, A, method, results, it's good. Conclusion seems to be a bit trickier. Exposure and outcome, we do quite well. Actual size is really easy to find. Uh, probably because there is, there is always numbers in there, and that seems to be good for the classifier. Uh, something more that can be said is that, well, basically, we have high specificity, low sensitivity. Uh, basically, we guess negative a little bit too often. Still, we, have, we think the results are quite good for the rhetorical categories. And some good results for some of the concepts as well. And I think the important thing is that we have the exposures and outcome, because that's something that the epidemiology guys want to, that's the thing that they mostly want to have, to know what has been done. I mean, that, that tells you something, what has been done with this cohort. Uh, so we can say this, we can say that a sentence like this, smoking education and physical activity levels, contains an exposure, but that a sentence like subjects were followed for 15 years for incidence of corona, it, it does not contain an exposure. So in the future, we are, uh, well, we actually have moved to us. We want to extract the actual, I mean, this part of the sentence. We're not really there yet. Uh, for that, we, you can use something called named entity recognition. We're not there. Uh, there is a demo here. I'm not going to show that, but it's basically can, you can input sentences here and get the score for each of the categories. And yeah, the black ones here tell you that it's a positive one. There are some limitations that I want to take up here that we currently treat the sentences in isolation. We don't really use the correlation within abstract and things like that. That's probably useful. Uh, categories are also treated in isolation, so we could also probably use that. Another thing is that we use abstracts. Uh, we can't really say that this works for full text, which would be nice if it does, but we, it's sort of hard to uh, extrapolate in that way. Uh, there are other categories that may be important here that we haven't looked at, uh, and a problem with unbalanced categories, but that's a problem of getting data. So that, with that, I finish my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. Do we have questions from the audience? One moment, if you can take the microphone. Thanks. Yeah. It's for me. I was just wondering. If, uh, if you've given any thought into how to publish things so they're easily machine readable. So maybe if there yeah. was custom to include a table with some format or something like this, then this would be a starting point for your system. Yeah, of course. I mean, the, I think the first abstract that I showed you, uh, example, I mean, all of, all of those example abstracts are from this year, so it's, I'm not going to say that there is a trend towards doing this, but I mean, this kind of table, of course, is nice, but that would put us out of work, so, <laughs> on the other hand. So, but sure, I mean, it would be good if there were, uh, it, if it were, but I mean, it's also, I mean, it's also sort of an, I mean, always, when you write a paper, there maybe there always should be some room for, I don't know, artistic freedom or, <laughs> Whatever, so you shouldn't perhaps force. I was thinking more about something extra, so you could just. Make yeah, okay. Table, and then make an extra yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, of course, that would be uh, a good thing to have, but I, I f yeah. So uh, an extra table would be. be uh, but I'm not sure you can get publishers to. Uh, Cooperate with that. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we'll take years. yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, but a good idea. It's, uh, uh, it's something you can think more about. Yeah. Thank you, Johan. Uh, I just wonder out of curiosity, is uh, a text mining and natural language processing generally linear classification problem, like you are using like linear classifier? Is it a sort of um, the symmetry in your data uh, uh, can be sort of addressed with a linear classifi classifier or you need to do some, some non-linear classification? Like is it a feature of yeah. text mining in general or is it just for your particular Usually, problem? Usually, yeah. Yeah, that's a tricky question, actually. Um, usually you truncate the data, so you sort of remove the low frequency and high frequency words. So, but it's a good, uh, yeah. I mean, actually this uses the logarithm of the frequencies, so already there, I think. But yeah, I have to <laughs> sort of pass on. I mean, there are other methods that use uh, other kinds of measures. It's, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what to answer. <laughs> Sorry. It's, uh, okay, so the, these are really interesting and fantastic tools. So, what do you think about the future? What I mean, you want to develop these tools further, do yeah. more research on the tool, but also how do you vision that these tools will be used by researchers? And if you think ahead of a couple of years, I don't know. Maybe I mean this is mostly made for uh, people working with uh, uh, yeah in cohort studies, trying to document it. But I guess it could be used for text summarization. I mean, the ideal thing is perhaps to have some kind of Chrome extension, web browser extension that when you go to a paper, you quickly get a summary of it in an extra box or something like that. So but do you think uh, it could be used also, I mean, in the future with more tools and stuff so that you could be better to find the relevant papers for your research or? That would be, uh, yeah, because that's something that takes time, right, to, to, but for that you, I mean, it's always difficult, to, what is relevant, I mean, that's always, but, I mean, of course, there could be some kind of, I mean, if you look at citations, for instance, papers that are quoted often should perhaps be more important to, to, uh, to read for you and things like that, and, uh, but I think it's the main use is probably as a shortcut to, for, I mean, to find, is this uh, piece of text, is this documentation, or is, I mean, or is it a solution to something, or is it just questions, or is it just banter, or something like that. So I think there are some uses there for different things. But mainly, mainly for shortcutting, so you don't have to read everything. I mean, reading hundreds of papers is, takes time, and so it would be nice to have a good, good summarization of them, I think. Okay, let's um, thank um, Johan again.